Hare Krishna. Welcome to our virtual Sunday feast. Today uh, we're speaking from Sage Cottage in County Wicklow, in sunny uh, southeast of the Republic of Ireland. I'm Kormadas. Welcome. Today we're going to be continuing to read from my book, The Great Transcendental Adventure. And today is a milestone. This is episode 10. Episode 10 of The Great Transcendental Adventure. So we were reading last time, uh, 1972, Srila Prabhupada in Australia. And he is at present in our narration in Melbourne and Sydney, Melbourne, or as we, we uh, call it, Melbourne uh, and Sydney. And he visited both places and he flew from one place to the next. And uh, that's uh, March of 1972, which is 50 years ago. Oma gyana timirandasya gyananjana salakaya chaksurun militam yena tasmai sri guru vena maha. Sri Chaitanya manobistam stapitam yena bhutale swayam rupa karamayam dadati swapatantikam. Upendra had promised young Simon Buttonshaw that he would introduce him to Srila Prabhupada. And in the afternoon he got his chance. After Prabhupada's post-luncheon nap, Upendra, accompanied by Simon, now shaven-headed and dressed in saffron cloth, entered the, the quiet and sanctified room. This is the Melbourne Temple in uh, Burnett Street, St Kilda. It's become a holy theatre. Prabhupada was relaxing behind his low desk, flanked by two large vases of flowers. His left arm behind his head he was reclining on a large white cotton bolster cushion. Prabhupada was always so uh, aristocratic. He appeared golden hued and regal. Natural light streamed in from the large windows behind him, making the saffron walls appear to glow and highlighted tiny sparkles on the modest crystal chandelier mounted above. Upendra and Simon bowed and sat on the polished wooden floor directly in front of the table. Now Simon was an arts student who had come in touch with Krishna consciousness. He actually went on after this to become a, quite a famous artist and uh, of course a disciple of Srila Prabhupada uh, who will be known as Shyamananda. Upendra spoke up, Srila Prabhupada, this is Simon, he's an artist. Upendra, uh, sorry, Prabhupada looked at Simon and raised one eyebrow. So, you have doubts? Simon was astonished. Yes, he did have doubts, but he hadn't voiced them to anyone. Yes, Prabhupada, he replied. So, what are they? Prabhupada coaxed. Simon swallowed and spoke out in earnest. Well, I enjoy the chanting and everything, but I... I, I just find it really hard to accept that there were, there were four-headed beings flying around on top of giant swans. And I mean, the whole thing seems so mythological that it's beyond my experience. And I, I, I can't accept it. So what am I supposed to do about it? Prabhupada was silent and he shut his eyes for a few moments. Opening them, he spoke assuringly. I am your friend, Prabhupada said. Don't worry, you have nothing to fear. He explained to Simon that he should observe and trust what he had experienced with the chanting, hear from the spiritual master, study the scriptures, and allow his faith to gradually grow. He should not worry about things that were beyond his experience. Simon felt immediately at ease. It seemed to him a very reasonable answer. And he began to appreciate that he was someone who had enormous skills in dealing with people. Prabhupada sat up. So, you are an artist? Can you design temples? Simon was taken aback. He had never attempted such a thing. I could try, he said boldly. Yes, continued Srila Prabhupada. We have a temple that needs to be designed in Vrindavan. Oh, answered Simon. 
He had heard that Krishna lived in Vrindavan, but he had not realized that it was an actual place. Shamasundara, who was sitting to the side, spoke up, reminding Prabhupada that he had already asked someone else to work on a design for the Vrindavan temple. Prabhupada indicated that this was not a problem and that there was no harm in more than one person working on the same project. Prabhupada drew the conversation to a close. So he said to Simon, you do some sketches and bring them back and we'll see. That afternoon, Simon began earnestly drawing designs, honoured that Srila Prabhupada had entrusted him with such a responsible task. Srila Prabhupada had been, had been invited to speak that evening at a Cistercian monastery in the small town of Yarra Glen. In the religious house known as Tarawara Abbey, that's an indigenous Australian name, Tarawara Abbey, lived an enclosed Roman Catholic order of monks that originated from Europe in the 11th century. A monk who resided at the abbey, Father Daniel, had been associating with Upananda for some time and he had been reading Srila Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita as it is. It was Father Daniel who had suggested that Prabhupada address the monastery and had enthusiastically canvassed amongst his fellow monks. Advertising the event by putting up posters and pictures of Prabhupada on the abbey's refectory walls. It's interesting that after this, um, after this Sangha, um, Father Daniel became fascinated with uh, Vedic culture and he travelled to India and studied uh, further. Upananda recalls, It was late Thursday afternoon, not a very auspicious time, Prabhupada said that uh, travel on a Thursday afternoon is not recommended. And somehow or other, we had found ourselves stuck in a bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic jam. All the Melbourne commuters were leaving town. Shama Sundara was getting very irritated because it had taken us one hour just to get to the outskirts of the city. He said, uh, Prabhupada, I, I think we should go back. This is too much trouble. Melbourne was experiencing unseasonably warm weather and it was very humid and uncomfortable in the car. Srila Prabhupada asked, everything has been arranged? Hanuman was sitting next to me, next to Upananda, and I was nudging him to say something so we could cancel the engagement because it seemed like it was very inconvenient for Srila Prabhupada. But Hanuman said, oh yes, Srila Prabhupada, everything has been arranged. They are all waiting for us. So Prabhupada said, yes, you can go on. Finally, we got to the open road and we arrived at the abbey at seven o'clock, exactly on time. End of Upananda quote. Tara Wara Abbey was set on a hill amidst beautiful pasture lands, surrounded by gardens and vineyards and bordered by the Yarra River. Like many abbeys of its type, it grew its own fruits and vegetables, and after negotiating the long driveway, Prabhupada and his entourage climbed substantial stairways, passing through the outer balcony and entrance area, and came to a rectangular timber panelled reception hall. The hall was set up with some simple wooden chairs for the audience and a more elaborate seat for Prabhupada. A couple of devotees had come early and had engaged the most enthusiastic of the monks in picking fragrant roses and sewing them into a garland. Some nice devotional service there. As Prabhupada entered the hall, Father Daniel eagerly placed the garland around Prabhupada's neck and respectfully bowed with his head to the ground. Many of the assembled monks dressed in their black scapulars over white robes followed his example. Srila Prabhupada sat down, erect and cross-legged, and led a short kirtan. A monk turned on a large reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder, that's all we had in those days, and Prabhupada, in his natural, unrehearsed manner, began to speak, describing the origins of the Krishna consciousness movement as, quote, unquote, practically prehistoric. He told the small assembly of monks that 5,000 years before, at a meeting in Naimisharanya, near present-day Lucknow, great saintly persons had assembled to hear Sutta Goswami, one of the disciples of Sukadeva Gosh Shukadeva Goswami, speak on Krishna consciousness. One of the topics discussed at that ancient meeting 
was dharma or religion. Prabhupada defined religion simply to accept the orders of God, that's all. It doesn't matter what religion you are following. You may be Christian, I may be Hindu, he may be Mohammedan, but the test of religion is how one has developed God consciousness. As the monks listened respectfully, Prabhupada, the modern day representative of Sudha Goswami, spoke at length, liberally quoting from Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam, Brahma Samhita, and the Upanishads. We were very fortunate that that monk had recorded the lecture because uh, it is now on the Veda base and you can actually see and hear this lecture to this very day, 50 years later. As the monks, right, we read that, Prabhupada concluded, so we are preaching God consciousness throughout the world. That is our business. Practically throughout the world, they are rejecting God. You know very well, in England, there are many, many churches. They are vacant now, redundant. There is great necessity of God consciousness at the present moment throughout the whole world. Without God consciousness, all other qualifications are useless. So, our simple request is that whatever you may be, you make a cultivation of God consciousness. Scientifically, try to understand what is God. And if you consult Vedic literature, you'll get very accurate scientific, authentic information. So we invite all learned scholars, priests, philosophers to combine together and save the world from this fall down without God consciousness. That is our request. So I think all you respectable priests and fathers will kindly help me in this mission and I shall be very much obliged to you. Thank you very much. In question time, a soft-spoken priest with a distinct Irish brogue asked Srila Prabhupada what had been written about the future of civilization. Will we have a happy family over the earth or will there always be conflict? He asked. Prabhupada answer, Prabhupada's answer followed the theme of his lecture. That we are experiencing. This godless civilization means there is no peace. Although we are improving, just like I was talking yesterday, we have discovered the aeroplane, but we have given another chance of, uh, of danger. What is that? Skyjack? Hijack, Shama Sunda said. Ah, yes. So this is going on. So we are making something for our convenience, but we are creating something else which is inconvenient. So this is due to godless civilization. But if we become God conscious, then our progress of civilization will be very peaceful and happy. Anyone who has got devotion to the Lord, he is qualified with all good qualities. Just like you are God conscious, so you have invited us to speak because in you, the good qualities are there. So without God consciousness, there cannot be any good qualities. We are trying to educate people to be honest, to be gentle, to be fair dealing. But actually people are becoming dishonest, miscreants, rogues, thieves, due to lack of God consciousness. Prabhupada gave a very practical example. Quote, just like in the airport, all gentlemen are searched. They even sometimes searched Prabhupada's luggage, although sometimes they would give him an, an exception. What does this mean, Prabhupada says? It means that every one of us is dishonest. That is to be understood. So, what the education has produced, simply dishonest men. <coughs> Excuse me. Why is this? Because of godlessness, that's all. So it doesn't matter whether you are a Christian or a Hindu, people must be raised to God consciousness scientifically. Otherwise, it is doomed. Another monk wondered how it would be possible to understand God, who is infinite, by way of the finite mind and senses. That's a classic question. Even that question was asked by the great sages in the Srimad Bhagavatam in the 10th canto, in the chapter entitled Prayers by the Personified Vedas. That was one of the questions that was asked by the sages on the higher planetary systems. Anyway, this monk asked that question. Um, how is it possible to understand God, who is infinite, 
by way of the finite mind and senses? That was an, that's an intelligent question. Prabhupada confirmed that God was indeed unapproachable by mental concoction. There was, however, another process, the parampara system. So this is a very important answer. Prabhupada explained this by way of analogy. Just like on the roof, there is some sound. There, is, there were some sounds coming from the roof. So Prabhupada drew that situation into the discussion and made it a practical example. Just like on this roof, there is some sound and every one of, his, of us is making some suggestion of what that sound could be. This may be like this, this may be like that. This is one process of knowledge to understand the unseen by speculation. This is one way. It may be successful, <coughs> excuse me, or, or not successful. There is no certainty. But if someone from the roof says, the sound is due to this, then our knowledge is perfect. Just like someone's working on the roof. You say, you wonder what the sound is, and then the workmen on the roof say, it's okay, we're just uh, f fixing the plumbing. So then the answer is passed down to you from above. This is what parampara means. If someone from the roof says the sound is due to this, then our knowledge is perfect. Similarly, if we speculate about God, who is adoxaja, who is beyond the range of our mind and speculation, then we can come no further than the conclusion of Brahman realization, impersonal God. But if we hear from God or his representative, then we get perfect knowledge of God. Mm, so that's, that's a good answer to that important question. A young priest in the audience paraphrased one of the teachings of the New Testament and asked Srila Prabhupada if he agreed. And this is what he said. Uh, this is what the man said. If any man says he loves God and does not love his neighbor, then that man is a liar, unquote. Prabhupada concurred. Yes, if one loves God, he said, he must love everyone. Prabhupada pointed to a goblet of water on the lectern before him. Just like my heart is now thirsty, I am quenching by drinking water and pouring it here in my mouth. So as soon as I put this water here, immediately the energy is distributed all over the body. So a God-conscious person cannot be neglectful or envious of anyone. That is the test. Sarve gune statra samasate suraha. All good qualities. So this is a good quality, to love your neighbor, to give them service. So if actually one person is God-conscious, he may be sympathetic with the troubles of his neighbor. Anyone, not only human beings, but animals also. They're, they are also living entities. A God-conscious person has no discrimination between human beings and animals, or trees, or plants, because they are all living entities. Prabhupada halted, and Hanuman Prasad Goswami thanked the members of the monastery for their kindness in receiving Prabhupada and the devotees. Father Daniel concluded with a few words of appreciation. In the kirtan that followed, many monks heartily joined in chanting and dancing alongside with the devotees. Father Daniel then invited Prabhupada and the devotees to an adjoining room to take refreshments. The devotees were pleasantly surprised to discover a vast array of food spread before them on a large medieval-style wooden banquet table, hot milk, fruit juice, varieties of nuts and dried fruits, and many types of whole and cut fresh fruit, including large bunches of grapes from the abbey's vineyard. The devotees looked at Prabhupada for his assent. Prabhupada smiled approvingly. Yes, we can take. Because Prabhupada told us that if we're eating outside of the temple environment where the food stuff may be contaminated in some way, uh, then we can take milk and fruit. So uh, Upananda had told Dan Daniel ahead of time, Prabhupada is, said that we should only have fruit and milk. So they got every possible a, a variety of dried fruit, nut, fresh fruit, milk and everything. He, they did a wonderful job. Father Daniel introduced Srila Prabhupada to the elderly abbot, Dom Kevin O'Farrell. They were all Irish. <laughs> Dom Kevin O'Farrell, to whom Prabhupada took an immediate liking. The devotees paired off, each speaking to a different member of the community. Meanwhile, Prabhupada sat in a wooden rocking chair and spoke to the abbot. 
Jagatarini recalls, Srila Prabhupada and the abbot were contemporaries in age. It was impressive to see how kindly and respectfully Prabhupada dealt with him. At one stage, the abbot began speaking about the war. They both laughed and Prabhupada appeared like a young boy. Even Prabhupada patted him affectionately as if the two were old friends. Prabhupada looked completely at ease. I was struck by their intimate exchange. As Srila Prabhupada appeared to leave the abbey, Father Daniel asked him one last question. Your Grace, what is your meditation? My meditation, Prabhupada answered thoughtfully, is my writing. Friday the 7th of April 1972, coming up for 50 years ago. Each day in Melbourne, Melbourne, as he had done for years, Prabhupada worked in the very early hours of the morning, combing through the Sanskrit and Bengali Srimad Bhagavatam commentaries of the great Acharyas. Following their explanations, he would select passages from them, uh, adding his own knowledge and realization, and then laboriously weaving it all together into his Bhaktivedanta purports. It was a great demanding task and required the utmost concentration. It was therefore a great disturbance when devotees allowed the back door, which was almost directly under Prabhupada's room, to slam noisily in the wind at all hours of the day and night. I remember that back door. Prabhupada called it a heart-cracking sound and asked that it please be stopped. Prabhupada was translating the extremely grave and complex Vedic knowledge into a modern concept, context, thus making it understandable to Western readers. To speak best to the people of the world through his Srimad Bhagavatam, Prabhupada required a very conducive situation, like not slamming doors at all days and hours of the day and night. The devotees tried hard to comply. Occasionally we a few slam doors happened. That morning, the Age newspaper showed a photograph of Srila Prabhupada chanting on the beads of the initiates at the previous day's fire sacrifice with the caption, quote, New members are initiated into the Hare Krishna movement yesterday at the Sri Sri Radha Krishna Temple at St Kilda. Conducting the ceremony is His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. Unquote. I was sitting in on that ceremony to getting my second uh, initiation. Simon had taken the task of designing the Brindaban temple very seriously and had been working on all the previous afternoon. Before Prabhupada's morning massage, Simon entered Srila Prabhupada's room with some preliminary drawings in a sketchbook. Prabhupada was pleased with his work and invited Simon to accompany him on his flight to Sydney the next day. Although Prabhupada took it as his primary business to work solidly on his writing, he was generally always available to talk to guests. But whenever someone would come to see him, he wouldn't waste time. He talked philosophy and logic. He constantly argued against atheism and impersonalism. And to prove the existence of God and the universality of Krishna consciousness, he often spoke strongly. Later in the morning, he was visited by a group of followers of the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, the spokesperson of the group, the manager of a well-known Melbourne vegetarian restaurant, which was called Shakahari, uh, seemed preoccupied with the concept of merging into the absolute. With impeccable logic, Srila Prabhupada patiently explained that the concept of merging was not only unappealing, but also particularly impractical. Prabhupada said, you are all individuals. Every one of us is an individual. So how, how can you conceive of merging? Suppose, just like we are all here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. How can we merge? You just study the philosophy. We are here, eight persons. How can we merge into one? Have you got any idea how we can merge? These eight persons, how they can merge into one? To realize ourselves, 
said the leader of the group. Well, I suppose, if suppose you have realised, now, how do you merge? In realisation, there is that. In realisation, there is merging. In reali- uh, Prabhupada shook his head. He held up his right hand, his fingers extended. Now, there were five fingers. One, two, three, four, five. How can they merge into one? By realising this, Prabhupada patiently repeated his example. No, there were five fingers. One, two, three, four, five. So these, they are all different. Five fingers. How can they merge into one? What is the process? The name of the process? No, name or not name. How these five fingers can be merged into one? Tell me. Prabhupada answered his own question. He reached down and touched the microphone that was sitting on his desk. You can hear the crackle of the microphone as he does it. Just like here is a thing. All the fingers capture it. He picked up the microphone with his fingers. It becomes one. Although there were five, one, two, three, four, five, they have become one. Becomes one? Yes. If the interest is one to capture this, then it is one. Prabhupada replaced the microphone on the desk, and you can hear that also in the recording. That means you cannot lose your individuality, but if your interest is one, then you merge into it. Do you understand? Just like you were all Australian, how do you merge into the Australian conception? Because as Australian, you have one interest, so individuality cannot be killed. That is not possible. You are all individual, but when you make your interest one, then you merge into that thing. Your personality is different from his. His personality is different from you. But because we are all uh, of the same interest, therefore we are all one. Just like us, we are all individuals, but our interest is Krishna. Therefore, we are one. During his massage today, Srila Prabhupada gave Upendra a recipe for eggplant pickles. Mm -hmm. Small baby eggplants, he said, should be cut carefully and sautéed in a little oil with spices until soft. A small amount of sugar and something sour like vinegar, he said. He did. And then they should be packed into a jar. The finished product, Prabhupada said, will be very tasty. Soft, sweet, spicy and sour. Mm. I went on and actually got a recipe, created a recipe, and it's perpetuated in my cookbooks. Upananda and Hanuman Prasad Goswami has had been determined to promote Srila Prabhupada's first visit to Melbourne properly. What better way, they had thought, than with an impressive poster. We were very big on posters in those days. In fact, the whole world was, was into posters because there was no, there was no uh, social media. So posters was the way to get your message out. Only a few days before Prabhupada's arrival, Upananda had run up the stairs with the first batch of posters fresh from the printers. Entering Prabhupada's room in construction, he had dropped the heavy load on the fresh sanded floorboards between ladders and half-empty paint tins. This was a flashback. Paint-speckled devotees dressed in overalls had quickly climbed down from scaffolds and scrambled for a close inspection. They were impressed with what they saw. In the centre of the bright, eye-catching poster, Prabhupada sat cross-legged in a striking pose. The famous profile shot was taken at Conway Hall in London a few years before and immortalised as the logo on the cover of Back to Godhead magazine. With eyes closed and his form effulgent before a dark background, famous photograph, Prabhupada sat garlanded and swathed in a flowing wrapper that gathered in delicate folds on his lap. His forefinger and thumb were joined, and his middle finger was raised, displaying the mode of instruction, jnana mudra. He appeared regal and authoritative, yet profoundly peaceful. Under his picture in bold lettering was written, For thousands of years, holy men in India have reached the transcendental realm of superconsciousness, by vibrating sacred hymns. And now, His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada 108, 
brings this consciousness to Australia for all seekers of enlightenment. At the Melbourne Town Hall, 8pm, 7th of April, admission free. Huge cream capitals at the top of the poster confidently announced Jagad Guru, the spiritual master of the universe. Upananda knew that this statement, although bold, was not out of line with Vedic authority. Although the Mayavadi sannyasis, who adhere to the impersonal school and claim to be the real knowers of Vedanta philosophy, declare themselves to be gurus and also Jagat gurus, or the spiritual masters of the entire world, Prabhupada had written in the Chaitanya Charitamrita in this connection, quote, Of course, they cannot see the, in, the entire world. Sometimes they dress gorgeously and travel on the backs of elephants in processions, and thus they are always puffed up, accepting themselves as Jagat gurus. Srila Rupa Goswami, however, has explained that Jagat guru properly refers to one who is the controller of his tongue, mind, words, belly, genitals, and anger. Prithivim susisyat. Such a Jagat Guru is completely fit to make disciples all over the world. End of quote. By the time Prabhupada had arrived, Melbourne shone brightly with the red and cream posters. Walls, bridges, building sites and shop fronts were covered. Only the most inaccessible surfaces were spared. Especially targeted were the university suburbs of Fitzroy and Carlton and up-and-coming hippie hangouts such as Greville Street, Praran and the T.F. Much Ballroom and popular eating places like the Feedwell Foundry and Shakahari where Melbourne's hungry eclectics chewed on Hunza pies, sipped miso soup, and discussed Zen and the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Smaller versions of the posters in the forms of handbills were passed out in their thousands. Head shops and alternative bookshops had agreed to mount the posters in their windows. The Age newspaper promised, A good evening, a good chance to hear the Swami, a bona fide representative for the mystical Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, a good chance to know the Hare Krishna movement a little better. Melbourne's youth in early 1972 were enjoying an interest in all things alternative. America had already experienced the apex of its hippie counterculture in the 60s, epitomised by the famous Summer of Love in San Francisco's Haight-Ashbury in 1967. But Australia's heyday had yet to come. Thus, as West Coast USA's psychedelic bubbles had all but burst, and the carefree, youthful, innocent optimism of the 60s was starting to tarnish, young Melbournians were in the, th were in the throes, on a much smaller scale, of a search for deeper spiritual reality. The tinkling bells announced evening arty. I was, I was doing, I was performing arati that night. I was the pujari. I was tinkling the bells. We had this lovely uh, Catholic church uh, brass bell that had four bells attached to it. It had the crucifix on top, and it had four little round bells underneath, which you sp you spun it around like this, and the bells tinkled, and they all had a different tinkle. A beautiful bell, actually. And I was tinkling the bell, and I had to stay behind, which was which was my uh, destiny. The tinkling bells announced evening arati, accompanied by Hanuman Prasad Goswami and his secretary Shama Sundara, Srila Prabhupada walked slowly down the stairs from his quarters. They entered the small temple room and offered obeisances to the golden deities of Radha and Krishna, beautiful Radha Krishna deities who are still living there in Melbourne Temple 50 years later. Apart from the pujari, Srila Prabhupada and his entourage, the temple was deserted. Literally everybody went to the to these programs except for the one lucky pujari. The devotees were all busy decorating the cavernous Melbourne Town Hall with flowers and unloading instruments, pictures, incense and boxes of sweets. Srila Prabhupada and his assistants walked out into the chilly, slightly chilly, early autumn night and stepped into the waiting car. 
Shamasundara slowly drove the late model Holden sedan through the streets of St Kilda towards downtown Melbourne. Crossing the Swanston Street bridge, traffic slowed. All around, bustling crowds were absorbed in their Friday night shopping. They had only one night a week when the shops were open, and that was Friday night, so it was a big deal. Since Prabhupada's party was early, Shama Sundara decided to drive Srila Prabhupada around the city while Upananda tried his best to be a tour guide. Here's the post office, Srila Prabhupada. That's where we do our Harinam chanting. And, and there's the city square, and, and here's the station. Prabhupada noted with interest the old Victorian-style buildings on the corner of Burke and Elizabeth Street, but he was not looking with the eyes of a tourist. As soon as they sell these buildings, he advised, we should buy them. The car circled the main city blocks, Burke Street. Srila Prabhupada looked out at the brightly lit department stores, Buckley's and Myers, with their glamorous display windows and festive Easter decorations, and the various fashion shops and jewellery stores. If any Indian man comes to this Melbourne city, Prabhupada said, he will be surprised with the standard of living. Prabhupada laughed. They will think that, oh, it is heaven. The material prosperity is far different from Indian cities, especially 50 years ago. At a few minutes before 8pm, the car turned into Swanson Street and drove through the VIP gates of the town hall. People were still streaming into the main entrance. Prabhupada and Shama Sundara entered the waiting room behind the stage to the strains of a hearty and passionate warm-up Kirtan, led by an equally hearty, passionate, and warmed up Nanda Kumar. His kirtans were memorable. Prabhupada entered stage right into a hall thick with fragrant incense smoke. Excuse me, lost my spot. Madanga drums thundered and the devotees leapt into the air, fiercely clashing their cartels. That was our style. Fierce is a good description. And chanting with ecstatic abandon, Jaya Prabhupada, Jaya Prabhupada, Jaya Prabhupada, Jaya Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada quickly sat on the large flower-bedecked lemon and pale green Vyasasan brought from the temple, its new gold trim shining under powerful spotlights. At the completion of the kirtan, Prabhupada intoned obeisances to the previous spiritual masters. He picked up his shiny cartels and sang, Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hadi. This is also recorded and it's also on film. A very old, super eight, black and white film. Little snippets. His voice strong and full of spiritual emotion. For the devotees seated eagerly around him in a semicircle on the massive stage, this was yet another opportunity for close, blissful association with their spiritual master. The hall was now packed to capacity. Close to 2,000 people had responded favorably to the devotees' advertising. It was quite a mixed audience, young men in denims, kaftans, tie-dyed shirts and beads, girls in Indian cheesecloth skirts and crushed velvet jackets, academics, students, housewives, men with shoulder-length hair and polo-necked sweaters, this is the 70s, and older theosophical society types. The vast hall was quiet with expectation as Srila Prabhupada put on his dark-rimmed spectacles and closed his eyes. Munaya Sadupristo Ham Bavadbir Lokamangalam Yatkrita Krishna Samprashno Ye Natma Suprasidati. Prabhupada had chosen to speak from verse 5 of the second chapter of the Srimad Bhagavatam entitled Divinity and Divine Service. Sudha Goswami addressed the sages at Naimasharanya who have assembled and questioned him on the absolute truth. O sages, I have been justly questioned by you. Your questions are worth, worthy because they relate to Lord Krishna, and so 
are of relevance to the world's welfare. Only questions of this sort are capable of completely satisfying the self. That's the translation of the verse that Prabhupada is speaking on. Prabhupada's voice was loud and strong. He stressed that the Krishna consciousness movement was not a new or concocted thing. It was very old and authorized. Somewhat in the same theme as at the, uh, at the monastery, but more general because this, is, this was a general crowd. Prabhupada chose his topics according to the nature of the audience. And this was a mixed audience. Prabhupada detailed the fragile condition of human life and the troubles of birth, death, disease and old age. When we are within the womb of our mother, he said, it is a very precarious condition. Any medical man knows this. We have to live there in this way, in a packed up bag, practically without any air. Just imagine, uh, just imagine if at this present moment you were put into an airtight condition, you would die within three minutes or three seconds. But in the womb of our mother, we have to live for a clear 10 months or more in that airtight, packed up condition. Just imagine how much troublesome this is. That is practical. We may have forgotten so many things we have forgotten, but that does not mean that the trouble was not there. Similarly, at the time of death, the miserable condition is so acute that we have to give up this body, and sometimes when a man becomes very much upset, he commits suicide, he cuts his own throat. Why? He cannot live in this body. Similarly, I, you, every one of us, experience troubles at the time of birth and at the time of death. We are living entities, living souls. Birth and death take place in this body. Death means sleeping for seven months. That's all. That is death. That's a, a classic quote from Srila Prabhupada. His definition of death. Death means sleeping for seven months. That's all. That is death. Elsewhere he explains that that, that means we're in the womb nine, he probably mentions 10 months, it's described in the Vedic literature as 10 months, 10 Vedic months, 10 Vedic length months, uh, not calendar months necessarily. So yes, and why seven months you say? Well, because after seven months, the embryo, the, the soul, the living being that's in the womb, he wakes up from his sleeping condition, starts to kick and realize here I am. He wakes up from his sleeping condition and he stays for another two months before he comes out. And in that last two months, he's aware of his, uh, of his condition. Previous to that, he was asleep. So Prabhupada says, death means sleeping for seven months. That's all. Uh, that's, quite, uh, that's quite a meditation. And um, when you think about it, it's um, not at all depressing and under those circumstances. You go to sleep. And there is that there was that common saying, uh, you know, rest in peace, rest in peace. Yes, you you do rest in peace. Uh, you got a, you get a new body, and if you're going into a, a, the womb of another mother, and it's a human mother, then that gestation period is predestined to be about nine months. And after seven months, you wake up from your sleep. You've been resting in peace, and you wake up, and you've got a new body in a new womb with a new mother and a new father and a new chapter of life. So it's brilliant. Death means sleeping for seven months. That's all. That is death. When this body is unfit for living, the soul gives up this body. And by superior arrangement, the soul is again put into the womb of a particular type of mother where the soul develops in that particular type of body. So it is a great science. How the living soul comes in contact with this material body, how he is transmigrating from one body to another. Our particular body, Srila Prabhupada explained, has been given to us for our particular type of standard of living. Just like you are, you are Australians, you have been given a particular standard of living. Prabhupada referred to the conversation he had had in the car to the on the way to the town hall. I was just speaking to my students, he said. You have been given the chance of a particularly high standard of living. 
Similarly, in India or in Africa or anywhere, the living entity has got a particular type of body with its particular type of standard of living. A tiger has also got a particular standard of living and also an elephant. And also in the higher planets, there are higher beings. They also have a higher standard of living and a vast duration of life. This information is there in the Vedic literatures. The audience was quiet and attentive. After 45 minutes, Prabhupada drew the lecture to its conclusion. We are trying to revive the original consciousness of the human society. It is called Krishna consciousness, just like these boys. Uh, mostly they are Europeans, Americans and Australians. These boys, they are not Indians, neither their father or grandfather knew about Krishna. Maybe some of them read Bhagavad Gita, but nothing particular, the science of Krishna. Now, how have they taken to that taken up this Krishna consciousness movement so seriously. The thing is that Krishna consciousness is not foreign. Each one of us has got Krishna consciousness within us. It is lying dormant. It is simply, it simply has to be aroused. One Vaishnav poet has said, Nitya Siddha Krishna Bhakti Sadhya Kabunai Shravanadi Suddha Chitti Karaye Udai. Udaya means to wake up. The Krishna consciousness is already there in your heart, dormant, simply by shravanadi, by the pure hearing process one can wake up. If someone calls a sleeping man, Mr. Such and Such, wake up, wake up. And after two or three callings, he will wake up and he will remember, oh, I have to do so many things. Similarly, as the Krishna consciousness process is dormant in everyone's heart, this Krishna consciousness movement presenting this Hare Krishna mantra is the process of awakening. If we chant repeatedly, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, then the sleeping man awakens to Krishna consciousness. Prabhupada's voice had a note of insistence. You can see him uh, at on the Vyasa Sunday in this black and white film clip. Uh, Prabhupada is very, his face is very intense and he finishes up the lecture like this. We must know, Prabhupada was practically shouting, we must know what I am, what is God, what is my relationship with God, what is this material world, why have I come here, why am I suffering, why do I have to accept birth, why do I have to accept death, <coughs> excuse me, why do I have to accept disease? Why do I have to accept old age? These are the problems, and these problems can be solved in human life, not in the life of cats and dogs. They cannot. So our only request is that you make your life successful, come to the real understanding of your existence. This is possible simply by chanting, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada asked for questions. Hanuman Prasad Goswami stood at the front of the audience with a separate microphone. A young hippie asked whether the seven levels of planetary systems that Prabhupada had listed in the lecture were related at all to the seven colors or the seven jewels of the yogi. Prabhupada answer, Prabhupada's answer was to the point. No. The young man inquired further. Is there any philosophy, doctrine, creed or ritual that can reduce God to a human thought process? No, Prabhupada rejoined. God cannot be forced to come down. Then he is not God. If God comes here, he comes by his own pleasure. You cannot force God to come. Just like at night, you cannot force the sun to rise. You have no power. The sun will rise in due course of time in the morning. At that time, you can see the sun. At that time, you will also see yourself and you will see the world. But at the darkness, you cannot force. You have no such searchlight or scientific advancement Then that you can force. Similarly, if you cannot force a material object like the sun to abide by your orders, how can you force God to come down? So he comes down at his own will. Not by your word. God is not like that. A respectably dressed gentleman then asked, 
What is your understanding of God? Is he something apart from us or are we altogether God? Prabhupada's answer was concise. Well, as you are apart from me, similarly, God is also apart from you. God is also an individual person, as you are an individual person, as I am an individual person. But the difference between God and you and me is this. You know your business. I know my business. But God knows everyone's business. That is the difference. Brilliant answer. Suddenly, the audience became restless. The devotees looked to see a tall, bearded man striding confidently down the aisle towards the microphone. A familiar sight around Melbourne, he was dressed as Merlin the Magician, complete with pointed black hat adorned with silver, silver moon and stars, leotards and a flowing black cape. It was the wizard. We used to encounter this wizard all over the all over Melbourne. Every time we were out there on Harinam there was the wizard and he was a he was a pain. He was a bit of a pain. A deregistered sociology student and somewhat of a despot come lunatic, he had been proclaimed the official wizard of the University of New South Wales, specializing in clever public word jugglery and buffoonery. He claimed to be researching tension resolution through absurd behavior. The devotees had encountered the wizard on numerous occasions ever since they arrived in Melbourne. He had sometimes attempted to publicly humiliate them in the city square. Although basically harmless, they felt they found him at best a nuisance and often an annoying disturbance. Now his brash, uninhibited behavior had led him to approach Srila Prabhupada that night. The devotees wondered how Prabhupada would deal with him. True to form, the wizard took the microphone and, much to the outrage of older members of the audience and to, to the delight of his hippie following, spoke out in his usual loud, affected voice. I, I would like to ask his divine grace a question. I'd like to phrase my thinking at the moment. I know that I am a fool and a rascal, but I'm thinking, am I the center of the universe? I, I think I am the center of the universe. I think I must prove it sometime next year. He rambled on pompously, his voice rising dramatically, until Hanuman Prasad Goswami unceremoniously wrenched the microphone from his hand. Srila Prabhupada turned to Shama Sundara. What is he saying? He said he's the center of the universe, Srila Prabhupada. <laughs> right. The hall was quiet. Prabhupada smiled and spoke calmly into the microphone. So, everyone is thinking like that. Everyone has the concept that I am the supreme enjoyer and everything is there for my pleasure. So, you are not different from anyone else. Actually, Krishna... He is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He is the center of the universe. So your imitation will not last long. The audience laughed and then stood up and applauded. A standing ovation, accompanied by whistles and cheers. Srila Prabhupada had exposed the wizard as just another materialistic fool. The wizard had met his match. It's fascinating, fascinating to know that I, I found out the other day that the wizard's still alive. He's 80-something, and he's still doing his buffoonery in, uh, in New Zealand. He's, he moved to New Zealand, and he's, he's, I think he's the official wizard in Wellington or one of those big cities. He's still... <laughs> except he's a very old wizard. Prabhupada indicated for a kirtan to begin and soon the hall was transformed by the combined sound of hundreds of voices chanting Hare Krishna. Never before in Melbourne had so many people come together in one spot to chant. The combined sound was tumultuous. 
Nandakumar's drum roared and cymbals clashed like a runaway locomotive. Devotees and guests alike danced on stage in the aisles, in the dress circles, losing themselves in the ecstasy of Harinam. Towards the end of the kirtan, someone started throwing ladus off the stage. The crowd went wild, leaping for the sweets. Even after Prabhupada left the stage, the chanting continued for a considerable time. As Srila Prabhupada was getting into his car, an Indian gentleman congratulated him on his lecture. Prabhupada put his hands together in respectful pranams and slightly lowered his head. Thank you, he said humbly. On the return journey to the temple, Prabhupada chanted half audibly in the back seat of the car, looking out the window in a way as quiet and unassuming as a child. Excuse me. His demeanor <clears throat> gave no indication that just a few minutes before he had been cheered and applauded <clears throat> by thousands. For all the fanfare, he remained untouched, aloof and innocent, while at the same time appearing grave and ancient. The devotees present were moved to recall Prabhupada's own words in this connection. Humility, Prabhupada had written, means that one should not be anxious to have the satisfaction of being honoured by others. Unless one is humble and meek, one cannot be qualified to sit at the lotus feet of the Lord. <clears throat> Prabhupada entered his room accompanied by an exhilarated group of devotees. Judging by the response that night, he told them, it augured well for spreading Krishna consciousness in Melbourne. Prabhupada sat down on a mat before a small marble table. Upendra brought a bowl of puffed rice and peanuts and a cup of hot milk. Prabhupada uh, took a few peanuts and deftly popped them into his mouth, chewing meditatively. He asked Shamasundara to play the tape recording of the lecture. Prabhupada listened to the whole class, including questions and answers from start to finish. As the devotees sat quietly listening with him. It was now approaching midnight. Srila Prabhupada stood up. The devotees rose and, as if on cue, offered their obeisances and left the room. In a couple of hours, while the whole of Melbourne slept, our Jagat Guru would be awake, dictating his revolutionary Bhaktivedanta purports to the beautiful Srimad Bhagavatam, a cultural presentation for the re-spiritualization of the entire human society. So, We'll finish there in our um, exciting serialization of the great transcendental adventure. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Jai Srila Prabhupada.